The following interview was conducted with Thomas S. Wilmoth, Bachelor of Science in the class of 1935 in Electrical and Computer Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, October the 31st, 2008 in Stewart Center. Also sitting in is his wife, Burnett, Burnett, Burnett Lakin. Um, the interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Well, I was born in Chicago and uh, lived there till I was about six. And uh, all I really wanted, I've always liked to make things. And all I really wanted in those days was a hammer and nails and some wood. <clears throat> and I worried that by the time I grew up, everything would be made. And my uh, parents moved to back to Indianapolis, and uh, my uh, father was uh, elected judge of the municipal court. And uh, his brother became a, uh, my father and his brother both um, never graduated from high school. And my, <coughs> and they went to the Spencerian School for Secretaries because uh, in those days there weren't any women secretaries. And my father got a job for the government and was transferred to uh, uh, the Philippines. So he went around the world at an early age. And when he came back, he uh, married my mother and uh, moved off to Chicago. And uh, his great-grandfather, his, his grandfather had been the uh, superintendent of schools in Ohio and uh, a, a farmer. And uh, he sold his farm, this is back in the 1800s. And he sold his farm and loaded the family on the train and took it as far west as it went, which was Effingham, Illinois. Then they went, bought a a team of oxen and a cart, and they went off and homesteaded. And he had uh, five or six children and uh, never educated any of them, I presume, because there were no schools. So that was my uh, grandfather. Very good. And uh, Where did you go to high school? Tell us what high, did you go to high school then in Indianapolis? Then in uh, Indianapolis, I went to Broad Ripple High School. Okay. There were 400 students in it. And uh, it was up on the banks of White River. Okay. Uh, any, do, uh, any student clubs that you belonged to when you were there? What? And I, um, I had a physics teacher there that taught me enough so that I never had any problem with uh, physics or uh, uh, some of the engineering uh, mechanical skills in college. Good foundation. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, did a, he did a good job for me. Right. Do you have any siblings? you have a brother? you have a brother and sister? Hey, I, had, I had a brother and a sister. My uh, brother um, wanted to study economics, but my father made him go to Purdue. And he gra I graduated in 35, and he graduated in 39. And uh, he, uh, <coughs> after he got out of the Navy, he uh, went to Indiana for one year and got a master's degree in economics and uh, came to Milwaukee and worked for Northwestern Mutual all his life. Oh, very good. He uh, eventually became their uh, chief economist. That's good. And uh, some of his, 
he uh, sort of revolutionized the insurance agency and because uh, he pointed out to them that they were only paying about a 10 cents out of every dollar in death benefits. The rest all went for uh, uh, policy interest and uh, operation of the company. And he pointed out to them they were really in the investment business, not the insurance business. And they changed their insurance policies and cut the premium in half. And the agents were very much opposed to this because an agent gets half the premium to start with and the other half over 10 years. But once they got the new policy in, they found they were selling more insurance than they ever did before, and they were very happy with it. Good. Yeah. Good. Uh, he died just about a year ago. Oh, okay. All right. Um, now, after you graduated from high school, then how did you happen to des decide to come to Purdue? And well, we, uh, your, we Purdue looked days. at Indiana, and we looked at uh, Rose Polytech and uh, Purdue, and uh, uh, I guess I, I wanted, <coughs> I had grown up, I remember the original radio back in about 1922, and my neighbor had a radio set, and I read the radio magazines, and I built a crystal set when I was, I'd be about 12. And I tell you, you took an oatmeal carton and you wound wire on it and you scraped the wire clean so you could make a slider to tune it. And you bought a little piece of galena and uh, you used a pin to stick in the galena and that became the uh, transistor, we would call it today. And then with a pair of headphones, you could hear a faint little sound. And uh, I uh, climbed up on the roof of the house and fastened the antenna. And then I climbed up a telephone pole and fastened the other end and put it up. <laughs> and it worked. With no direction, you did it yourself, right? Yeah. That's great. <laughs> then my uh, neighbor got a one tube set. And with a one tube set, you could have two sets of headphones. And a one tube set in those days cost uh, something like $150. And that would be uh, probably $3,000 today. So the, the next uh, thing was to make uh, some one tube, uh, up to five tube sets. And finally they got it uh, rigged up so you could have a loudspeaker. But all these things were operated by batteries. You had to have a six volt battery and a 45 volt battery. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they, uh, then along about 1929, they made the first radios with a, a dynamic loudspeaker that operated on AC current. And they had a lot of trouble with them. They keeping the hum out of the out of the receivers. So uh, about that uh, to go back a little bit, when I was ten, I sold uh, peanuts door to door to make a little money. And I uh, I would buy a basket full of uh, peanut bags. They were a nickel apiece. I sold them for a nickel apiece. They were, you bought them for three cents. And if you adjust that to today's dollar, that's about a dollar apiece. And then uh, along with the, my interest in radio, I started a radio repair business. And I tried that for, while I was in high school. Then, uh, and all along I, uh, somewhere I had a newspaper route and, 
and uh, carried papers. And I can remember in 1929, the paper was about a 150 pages, and in 1932, it was 24 pages. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about campus when you were here on campus. What was your major? You, you majored in engineering. Uh, yeah. And did uh, you live? Where did you live on campus? Do I you lived at the uh, fraternity house over at 27 Russell. Okay. It was the Delta Alpha Pi at the time. And I think it's Alpha Cairo or something like that okay. today. Okay, all right. Were you in any student uh, student activities, any clubs when you were here? I, um, in those days, they had what they called a distinguished student. And a distinguished student, it only cost uh, $25 a semester for tuition. And uh, I think the total cost of my going to college was somewhere around $500 a year. And uh, then when I was a senior in high school, I was the business manager of the yearbook. And when I came to college, I worked on the debris and became the business manager of that. So in the the uh, 34 or 35 semesters, I think I sold uh, 200 yearbooks myself. And uh, if there was any money left, the business manager and the editor split it. So uh, we made $1,100 a piece in 1935 when uh, men were working for Fifteen dollars a week. Wow. That was a lot of money. That's right. Yeah. That would be thirty or forty thousand dollars in today. Yeah. Very good. I was telling the class this morning that uh, governments have two ways of paying their bills. One of them is taxes, and the other one is inflation. <laughs> and there's no end to inflation. That's right. In 1776, whiskey sold for a nickel a gallon. <laughs> the universal measure of value. Yeah, right. Oh, after college, then what did what came next? Where there's did you have to go to the military? Well, after uh, uh, when, uh, you, when you finished, well, I, ha I had uh, a couple of job offers, and I took one with IBM to learn how to work on tabulating machines, they called them in those days. And uh, the, uh, the dean of the engineering department, of the electrical engineering department, told the GE people that they ought to look at me, that they might be working for me someday. So they offered me a job too, but I, I went with IBM work with them for them for six months. And on December the 13th, Friday, they fired me, which was quite a blow. Did they give you a reason why? Uh, Thomas J. Watson was running the company. He hired about 50 of us, and he changed his mind and <coughs> fired uh, 49. There was one man, and. Kansas City that they hid from him, and he later became president of IBM. Well, I went up to Milwaukee where I have a head of friend that worked for Alice Chalmers, and I got a job in the, from with Alice Chalmers on their student engineering student training course. And I worked uh, two years through that and then they sent me down to the hills of West Virginia to sell coal mining machinery. I was 23 years old. I looked like I was 16, and I called on people for a year without getting a single order. I thought I was never gonna get an order. Well then, <coughs> I, I had 
they had gotten well enough acquainted, so they started buying a little stuff. And for the next four years, I doubled the business every year. Well, about that time, the war came along, and I went back to the factory to work in the in the manufacturing section. At Alice Chalmers? At Alice Chalmers. In Milwaukee? Yeah. And uh, my first job was a shop where we were making uh, steam turbine rotors and uh, line shafting for destroyers. And in 60 days, I tripled the output of the shop, acquired a reputation, and uh, I had a number of different jobs there. They, uh, they had a material control department with 60,000 hand-posted ledger cards. Oh my. Huh. With and no part numbers. And uh, I acquired the job of assigning part numbers to these 60,000 items. I had about uh, 10 people working for two years. When we got done, we found we only had 45,000 items. <laughs> and of course, all this was done over the dead bodies of a lot of people that thought this was foolish. So I converted that whole thing to uh, IBM punch cards. And uh, then eventually uh, was in charge of the material control department. And we had had a bunch of consulting engineers that uh, decided the sales department should decide how much to order. Well, when you let sales department order things, they always order enough. And uh, things got so bad in one product line that I canceled all the orders on our foundry and canceled all the orders with Goodrich Rubber. Goodrich had to lay off one shift of employees and uh, vice presidents called me up and complained, and I told them I'd do whatever they told me. And none of them could have had enough courage to tell me not to do it. Well, it turned out at the time we were subcontracting a lot of work in this department. In uh, three or four weeks, we didn't need to subcontract money more. We were shipping on time and everybody was happy. <laughs> and when I worked in manufacturing, Alice Chalmers had about uh, 15 different buildings they worked in. And uh, historically, they had always moved everything between buildings on railroad cars. Well, I bought a bunch of heavy duty trucks that would haul 50 tons and we operated them inside the plant so we didn't have to worry about the roads. And then I couldn't get anybody to use them. So I thought I'll fix them. And I figured out a way to, a way to charge each department for the transportation costs. Well, at that time, Alice Chalmers had a tractor division and they had a general machinery division. The tractor division had 10% of the direct driver. General Machinery had 90%. They'd always allocated the railroad costs on direct labor. The first month we did this, we found out the tractor division was using 90% of the railroad and General Machinery 10%. The vice president of the tractor division called up bitterly complaining that his budget was out of control. The railroad cost a half a million bucks a year. They, uh, we used to bring a man in on Sunday to uh, load uh, <coughs> a car of coal for the power plants. When they got charged for it, why they put it in a, an inclined track so it would roll down by itself. So the moral is that uh, 
until you can charge people for services and until you know what they cost, you have no control. Then uh, I also bought the first radio, two-way radios they had for the, uh, the railroad locomotives and the trucks. And uh, that was over a bunch of dead bodies, too. <laughs> well, then um, uh, we got an order to build the generators for Boulder Dam. And the rotors for these generators were 30 feet in diameter, which is too big to ship on a railroad car. So the engineers designed them that the rim of, this is, of the generators was made out of sheet steels, about 36 by 72, and they were interleaved so they wouldn't fly apart, and they were all bolted together. And in the punch press for making them, why they got dye compound all over them. And there were 150,000 of these, and they weighed 75 pounds apiece. And they called me in one day and said, we want you to find somebody to clean these sheets. And I dragged them all over Milwaukee in my car without really finding anybody. And I had a neighbor that ran a dairy store. And I was telling him my troubles, and he says, I know how to clean those. So we built a little pan that we could put in my basement, and he brought a floor scrubber home that had wire, wire bristles on it. And he also bought some heavy-duty cleaner that they used in the dairy store. And we cleaned one sheet, and it was perfect. So the next morning, I went to my boss, and I said, uh, I know how to do this, but we don't have any facilities to do it. And there's a little group of us that would like to organize a company to do it. And he says, well, Tommy, he says, you know, it's against the company policy for a, uh, an employee to have an outside business. I says, I know. And he said, I don't know anything about it. So five of us put in 500 bucks a piece. Now in today's dollars, that would be $25,000 instead of 2,500. And uh, we got started and uh, my friend with the dairy store did the, ran the plant, and I kept the books weekend and still worked for Alice Chalmers. Then at that time, this was the period when five-year plans were a big thing. Everybody should have a five-year plan. How are we doing it today? how we're going to do it five years. Rings a bell, I've heard that term before. <laughs> and uh, so my boss was instructed to make a, two models of each shop that would show the machines today and the machines we'd have five years from now. Well, he made one set of those models and it cost uh, $75,000. And uh, he called the president in and showed him the model. And the president said, yes, that's fine. I like it. And my boss said, well, now you realize we've got about 50 of these shops. And uh, he says, do you really want to spend $75,000 doing this for all 50? And the president said, yes. And my boss quit right then. He moved over to A.O. Smith, which is another big Milwaukee company. And uh, I went with him. And we were building uh, landing gear for the B-52 bomber. And uh, A.O. Smith had, a, had an interesting history all of its own. Their grandfather 
C.J. Smith made the first bicycle frame that with a hollow tube instead of a solid bar. And his son was A.O. Smith, and he made frames for the Ford Motor Company. And his son was L.R. Smith, that was the genius of the whole group. He did the, he had a patent on electric welding. And he did the first electric welding. And uh, he made one mistake. He thought he could do all the welding for the whole United States and wouldn't license anybody. Well, in the, in the process of doing that, he had to build welding machines and he also had to build a plant to make the weld rod, which he did. And uh, in 1918, he built a frame machine with 80 stations on it that made uh, 10,000 frames a day for the next 40 years. Then uh, he decided to build a, at this time they were burning all the natural gas off in Texas because there was no way of getting it up north. Every city had a plant where they burnt coal and made the gas for the local community. And then uh, he conceived the idea of welding pipe together to make a welded pipe and uh, build a plant that uh, took a piece of pipe, a piece of steel, nine feet wide, 40 feet long, and three quarters of an inch thick. And there were two, three big presses that formed it into a tube. Then he welded it, pressure tested it, machined both ends, and made one piece every 45 seconds. And that mill made 10, to, 10 miles of pipe a day for the next 20 years and made possible the pipelines of this country. Yeah, really good. Very good. <laughs> well, <clears throat> uh, I uh, had several different jobs at A.O. Smith and all the time I was keeping books for Scott Industries. And um, after we completed the uh, metal cleaning, I, uh, some of the people took their money and quit, and we brought another man in that uh, uh, decided we would go into the, the centrifugal pump business. And we spent, a, and we could sell easily a thousand pumps a year. So we built all the tooling for these pumps. And uh, the first year we sold three pumps. <laughs> so then we became a general machine shop and tried to make a living that way. And I was running the plant that uh, made welding machines for A.O. Smith. When I took the plant over, I was losing $25,000 a month. In a year, I got it breaking even, and then we made money the next two or three years. Well, the man we had running the plant was an interesting person. He. Uh, really wasn't interested in money. He just wanted a lot of machinery and a lot of people asking him what to do. And he took all our capital, which wasn't very much, and spent it on machinery. And my brother and I had to bail him out. So I decided I had to quit my job and go down and run the place. And at that time, we had a big order from Western Electric, who was, which was building the uh, direct dialing system that they put in after World War II. 
And at that time, all this was done with mechanical relays. And we, they needed a tremendous number of mounting bars for all these relays. And we were drilling, tin tapping, I think uh, 500,000 holes a day uh, for, for them. So it looked like I, there was enough money to support me. And I went down to run it. And this other man was a real good salesman. He was going to sell the stuff. Well, he decided he wanted to be in business for himself. So he stole half the employees and started out on his own. And Western Electric canceled the contract. And I had a hard time. <laughs> and <clears throat> But we managed to survive. And uh, then the city of Milwaukee came after me for some back taxes. So I was, uh, after 10 years in business, I was 20,000 in the hole. And I was selling uh, machines in order to raise enough money to, for the payroll. And uh, I had a friend out in uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin, that had gotten an order to make all the hydraulic cylinders for John Deere. And I knew that the cylinders had to be honed. And honing is a relatively new process that at that time and probably still yet is not well understood. There was a man by the name of Hutto in 1922 that was trying to make a better automobile engine. And in those days, all the machines ran with sleeve bearings. And in a sleeve bearing, there's a wedge of oil that goes around once every two revolutions so that you don't bore a round hole with a sleeve bearing. And Hutto knew this, and he conceived of taking four or five abrasive sticks and figuring out a way to expand them inside the hole. And he ran them up and down on a drill press and he could make a round hole, a cylindrical round hole with very close tolerance and uh, whatever surface finish you wanted. And uh, that was really the uh, origin of the home tubing for hydraulic cylinders. Now he had a, a service man by the name of Matthews that figured out that if he bought a tube and used this fancy honing machine, he could sell that for a hydraulic cylinder. So, and I knew what a home was because I'd had one at Alice Chalmers. So I'm selling this guy the machine. He goes out of the office and there's a used machinery magazine on his desk. I thumb through it and there's a picture of a honing machine I could buy out of war surplus for $2,000, which is about all the money I had. I tore the page out, he came back, I said, Frank, if I buy a home, will you give me some business? Because I knew he didn't have one. He said, yes. So I called a micromatic home and asked him to furnish the tooling for this machine. And they said, well, the tooling, you know, they'd be about $800. Well, then they came around and looked at the machine and they said the tooling was $15,000. Well, when the Western Electric job was over, I had enough material to run another 10,000 pieces. So I'd run those pieces and
gone back to Western Electric and told them the shop had made a terrible mistake and would they buy them from me. And they said, well, not now, but maybe later. Well, they called up and wanted the 10,000 pieces, so I had enough money to buy the tooling. <laughs> You're right there at the right time. <laughs> yeah. Well, then I, so I got the tooling. We hired one man that knew how to hone, and we honed our first job, and the abrasives cost me more than I sold the job for. So then I <coughs> looked at the cost structure of abrasives. And uh, basically we're using 3 8 square, half square, 5 16 square stones. And each time you jump one of those levels, the usable cross-section goes up about 50%, but the price only goes up 10%. So I took the home tools apart and made drawings of it. And then I figured out how to use a half inch square stone instead of a three eighths inch square stone. And that made the business profitable. Then originally we figured that eight feet an hour was a reasonable production. Today, that's closer to 40 feet an hour. So uh, the first year I had this one customer. Second year I got two more. And all this time I was uh, working on other people's material. And when you're a small business, it's important to understand the tax structure. And for a small business that has no inventory, it's uh, legal to fire a loan on cash basis accounting. And under cash basis accounting, you don't count receivables or payables when you figure your profit. So I kept the books on a cruel basis, but I filed on cash basis. So at the end of the year, I would pay all the bills and maybe not deposit a few checks. And I, in effect, I had a, an interest-free loan of the receivables. And that's the only way I financed the expansion. And, uh, <clears throat> If the IRS converts you, you have to pay the tax immediately. But if you convert yourself, you get five years to pay the tax. So I ran the receivables up to about $5 million before I got scared and converted. But uh, after that second year, I realized I couldn't sell all this stuff myself, so I went down to the steel warehouses in Chicago and got them to Stockholm tubing. And uh, from them, I got acquainted with an outfit in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, the Retta Pump Company, and they were making pumps that dropped down into an oil well to pump oil out. And their pumps, the motor would be 150 horsepower, and they build it in a tube four inches in diameter. And they had all sorts of troubles because in those days there was nothing but seamless tubing. And it wasn't a uniform size, and it wasn't straight. And then the pump itself was another 30 feet. Well, when I made the tubes for them, I could make them all the, exactly the same size. So they eliminated six lathes that were turning the stator laminations to fit. Then I told them I could make the tube straight, and they didn't believe me. So I made one load and straightened it. And 
and it's now about 40 years later, and they're still buying tubing from me. Good. Well, <coughs> along the line here, we decided that uh, the state of Wisconsin changed the law so that they didn't tax inventory. So I decided I could afford to buy tubing. So I started buying tubing myself instead of going through the steel warehouses. And I uh, quickly ran out of space because uh, uh, I had started out in 4,500 square feet and I would expanded it little by little till I had 20,000 square feet but it was a downtown Milwaukee location and the neighborhood had changed from old, the old German neighborhood to a black neighborhood. And people were afraid to come to work down there. So I went looking for a new location and I wandered over Indiana, Illinois part of Ohio and southern Wisconsin and uh, found a little town in western Wisconsin, Muscaday, M-U-S-C-O-D-A. And they had a public spirited citizen that had started a, in a little industrial park. There were only 1,500 people in the town. and. Um, he encouraged me to come to Muscaty. And at the time, he was negotiating with a man that was going to bring a 500 man plant there. And uh, I went out there one Saturday, and we, the three of us, talked all afternoon. And I drove this fellow back to Milwaukee with me. And I decided I didn't trust him. And I found out a long time ago that I don't trust somebody. It doesn't matter how good the deal is, stay away. So I called up my friend at Muscadet and told him I liked him. But as long as we were involved with this man, why, I was going to pass. So uh, he called up his fellow board members and found out this fellow had been soliciting money from them to bribe the treasurer of the company to get this him to move there. So they called up the company and of course they'd never heard of the guy. So I made my reputation there. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, one of the things that, about um, giving back some of the, you've been uh, with the libraries, like the Scholars Grant, your class well, gift. Uh, <clears throat> I remember I gave the uh, dean of the 1935 library $5,000 and he almost fell off his chair. <laughs> Nobody had ever done that before. Was this for the library scholars uh, grant? But that was your yeah. class gift, wasn't it? Was it when your 50th That was my first gift. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, then, uh, well, I made a, <coughs> uh, one of the interesting things, uh, after you make a little money, you find out you really don't know what to do with it. And uh, I can remember Emily came down one day and went back with enough money to get started on her computerization. Yeah. yeah. That was a very nice gift, very nice. And I'd nice. always been uh, fascinated with, with computers. In our company, when we bought our first computer, we looked at Burroughs, IBM, and uh, Data General. And the people that bought the Burroughs computer, most of them went bankrupt. They never made one that would work with more than one terminal. And uh, anyway, we picked Data General. Uh, uh, in the first four terminals we had, everybody was scared to death of them. And today, uh, 
they'd all be mad if they didn't have a computer <laughs> on their desk. That's right, yes. Um, but uh, the light for, for the researchers, your, the class, your 50th anniversary, the class of 1935, the Library Scholars Grant, which was really nice. You, mm -hmm. That was your class gift. Mm -hmm. And uh, we still, they still use that. It's, it's an endow it was an endowment. Is that the way it worked? It was uh, on one of these annuity contracts. Oh, okay, okay. All right. I remember, and that's been going, it's still yeah. ongoing. That's right. Um, the Dean of Libraries started an advisory board council, and you were on the inaugural yeah. board. Do you recall how you had Dean that extra? started it. Okay, yeah. okay. And you were on it for a number of years. What? You were on it for quite a long yeah. time. Yeah. And it's still going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did, did Dean Mobley call you and ask you to be on the board? How did you get on the advisory council? Did she call I don't you? Know. <laughs> she probably touched me and said, You're coming, right? <laughs> uh, I guess because I gave him some money. <laughs> uh, the President's Council, are you a member of the President's Council? Do you yeah, come to some I've of the. I've never participated much. Okay, do you come, have you come to any, come to the back to campus classes that they usually have? Or? No, no, I've never been back. Okay. I've always had to work for a living. <laughs> but let's talk about an award, the, pinnac the pinnacle award that Dr. Jeske gave you. Yeah. And how did, did someone call you? Sometimes I ask people how they find out about the award. Do you recall how it occurred? I don't remember. Okay, but you remember getting it. It was at the President's yeah. house at Westwood. I figure those things are window dressing. That's very nice, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about engagement, and I, I mentioned this off the record well, before we got started, the tour that you, for the well, University of Wisconsin in Platteville, um, you've been working well, with a particular Well, we hired a number of graduates from Platteville, mm -hmm. and I felt we ought to uh, contribute a little bit to the school. And you and you had uh, students working, uh, that come over and work for the company, or, or when they graduate? They come working for the company yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. That's nice. So they yeah, we've got uh, three or four plant managers that all came from Platteville. How is the the size of your town? Has it grown since it was it so small? Well, uh, well, today we believe it or not, we have uh, two hundred employees at that factory and 400,000 square feet, and uh, that's quite a change from 10,000 square feet and three employees. <laughs> right, right. Uh, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? Any tradition that comes to mind for you? No. None? Okay. How about an outstanding event? An outstanding event in your life? Does something come to mind? No. No? Well then? Any closing, what you'd like to do, some reminisce, any closing comments that you'd like to do? Uh, any closing comments, anything in summary that you'd like well, to make? Well, the, uh, the training I got at Purdue, I figure, has uh, enabled me to make more money than I never, ever expected. Scott Industries today has 700 employees and nine different factories. And then the other thing, I have a capable son that has run the place for the last 20 years. Do you stay in one of, the, do you uh, go operate between Texas and Wisconsin or do you just stay, you stay in the Texas plant? He went to Wisconsin for one year and uh, in his second year was asked to leave and then he joined the army and eventually became the aide to the commanding general at Fort Knox. And the general did a good job of training him. And when he came back, I sent him to the uh, Harvard uh, short course for uh, business owners. Okay. And uh, he has an unusual uh, sense of business judgment which uh, I'm not sure you can teach. Right, yeah. And you had a family member, your granddaughter graduated from Purdue. Yeah. Was that, and it was, uh, what is your granddaughter doing now? She got her degree in civil engineering? She's uh, in, uh, living in England and she and her husband have built a 
storage facility in England, which is apparently new over there, that is uh, quite successful. Is it a company that they started, or was it a company that they They started it. Oh, what, what type of company, what do they do? What sort of a company is it? For storage of things? Well, you've seen these uh, places where they have the garage door and you rent it. Store, temporary small size storage? Yeah, oh, she, okay. does, she does that. They also have uh, offices they, they rent out by the day. and Very good. And uh, England is, we complain about the red tape here. They, um, well, they, the story she tells about the English medical system would shock you. Oh, you would never vote for universal medical care. How did they happen to decide to go to England? Is her husband from England? Uh, her, uh, she met this guy on a tour and married him. He's from England? He's from England. Okay. So they went over the center of the business. We've right? tried to encourage him to come to the U.S., but I guess he's afraid. <laughs> he, well, he likes his home country, huh? Yeah. Any closing comments that you'd like to make? Well, I feel I've been very fortunate. Good. And we appreciate the and, opportunity. And uh, my wife, Bonnet, right. here right. has a lot of courage. She married an 85-year-old. <laughs> We're very glad that she was able to be there. <laughs> and you come back for the events, and you go to the games, and it's really nice. It's called Boiler Up, right? Yeah. Yes. Good. Thank you very much. Okay.